Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we've got uh, the green room packed full of human beings right now. We so do. we will introduce uh, our guests today. First and foremost, we actually were joined by this young man at the 2021 Performance Racing Industry Trade Show. Had a fantastic conversation as they made news about his team's alliance with Antron Brown, who is venturing out on his own uh, in 2022 to field the top fuel team. Uh, after many, many years racing under the Don Schumacher racing umbrella, it's a it's a whole new world in the NHRA scene these days. And I'm excited to bring him onto the show. The one, the only Justin Ashley. What's up, buddy? Well, What's maybe. going there on, guys? How's it going? <laughs> What's up? Swinging and ducking, man. That's what I like to say. Swinging and ducking. Um, and I want to, Mike and JT, I'm going to ditch you guys momentarily here. I apologize. J, uh, we're I've, I've gotten a little bit of feedback from my production team and they're like, Hey, we need more side by side. We need more of that. So we got to get more right. of this angle. So here we are, Justin, what's going on, man. What are you doing? Not much, man. Just, uh, working every day, trying to put things together for the season, getting ready to go. Right. The off season, uh, it goes quick, man. So we're only a few weeks away from Arizona. Get testing going and underway. We're excited about it. How are you doing, Wes? Good? Man, I am fantastic. Uh, if I was any better, I'd be you, buddy. And uh, <laughs> I, I am curious how this is a tight, tight off season, right? I mean, this, it, it goes by really quick. What's the biggest challenge from like the end of the season to the next? Is it almost entirely with marketing partners, which is obviously going to be some of the topic of conversation today? Is it all about the marketing stuff, the sponsorships and branding and blah, 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 blah? Or is it getting ready with parts and pieces? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of things. You know, for, for our team, we're very fortunate in that, you know, we have Dustin Davis and Davis Motorsports that handles everything to the day-to-day -day operations of the car, to the employees and the team that we have. So they're able to specifically focus on being in the shop and getting the car and team ready to go for the season. And then on my side, I'm able to focus on the marketing stuff because there is so much that goes into it just to be able to get ready to go to start the season over the course of just a few months. So you know, it's been really busy on both sides, but certainly as we'll talk about today on the marketing side of things, just working with our existing marketing partners, uh, bringing on new marketing partners and welcoming them to the sport of NHRA drag racing. So it's been busy, uh, but really just trying to, you know, establish a platform, uh, you know, to be able to help our marketing partners get to where they want to get to throughout the season. It's pretty amazing that drag racing can be part of that conversation, right? Uh, I think there have been times in the past where we we felt like we didn't have, you know, as a sport, I say we, and I kind of speak on behalf of all of drag racing. It's like, oh man, where's corporate America? We need more big partners. We need more brands that see value here. But I mean, you're proof positive at this point in time that there are big companies, big brands that see value in not only NHRA drag racing, but drag racing in general. They recognize that this is a group of passionate fans, passionate people that will certainly support their cause if they support ours. Um, what's that been like? And I tell you what, it may be a great time to bring on Amber. Let's do it. I think I can see her chomping at the bit here. <laughs> Amber White with Phillips Connect uh, joining the Justin Ashley, uh, Dustin Davis Motorsports Program in 2022. Hi, uh, Amber, thanks for joining us. I think we're trying to get Jim, maybe. We're still trying to get him. He's at the airport right now, so we're trying to find some space to get in this crazy schedule. Hey, customers. no worries whatsoever. <laughs> and if it works out, fantastic. If not, we'll, we will sort it out in the future and bring him on here to talk uh, all things old school funny car racing. But I'm just curious, like between the two of you and Justin, I'll, I'll throw it to you first. When you made that announcement, Philip Phillips Connect uh, joining uh, Justin Ashley's 2022 Top Fuel campaign, I mean, is it a little bit of a pinch me moment to get like a recognize, like a big brand, a big company to to dive into drag racing and support your program? Oh, yeah, of course. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's pretty, it really is exciting. It's very humbling to be able to work with a company like Phillips Connect. When you think about it from a driver perspective and from a team owner perspective, you know, you kind of want to be very careful with the brands that you associate yourself with because you're a representative for that company, but you're also a representative for the sport of NHRA drag racing and your team. And that's what gets me so excited about working with Phillips Connect. Their parent company, Phillips Industries, has been around for 94 years, which to <laughs> me, right, 94 years is a long time. So to me, that speaks volumes of the type of company they are, the way they treat the people, the way they treat their employees, and the types of products that they make. So just to be able to represent a big brand, a big company like that is very humbling. And, uh, you know, we're all hoping that it's a start of a very long and successful relationship. 
Amber, what's your take? I mean, obviously you have a, a history with the NHRA and you you certainly know the value that exists here and the platform that exists here. Uh, kind of on behalf of Phillips, how excited are you guys? And and what was the catalyst? How did this this situation come to be? Well, it's I tell Justin he's kind of got the dream team. He never had to sell us on NHRA and what the value is because right. we know the time between runs and the hospitality and that opportunities for b2b within the sport you've got jim who's been uh, you know the first to 300 miles per hour in a funny car he's been a driver he's been an owner he's been a sponsor so now to take my experience from being on the marketing side and running those pre-races and even west the experience we had working together on the promod series and jna services and that that side um, and then also working on the social media side so i know the ins and outs of nhra i know the benefits um, we're, we're being careful and we're baby stepping with our CEO right. to show them the value. Um, we're building tech trailers. So, uh, a lot of our industry, we've had trade shows and trade shows are working during COVID. So we're taking the show to our customers now. Smart. Um, so it's a very different way of marketing and, uh, hopefully that it's going to show some success in our little test, uh, for the first three races. I think it's fantastic. And it's interesting because, and you've seen, you both have seen this in the world of drag racing, everybody's chasing sponsors, right? And you pretty much take whatever you get. Like if the latest, greatest candy bar that's existed for 30 seconds comes along and wants to throw a little bit of money your way, who's doing the rap, right? I mean, we're getting it done. We're ordering crew jerseys. We're doing the whole bit because we're just so hungry for a little bit of support. Um, so to your point earlier, a brand that's been around for, uh, century essentially to be able to represent them and to see a brand like that come into our sport i'm excited about like don't get me wrong i was excited when slammers milk showed up <laughs> if you remember that um or whatever and i'm excited every time something like that happens the next energy drink or whatever but to see a big influential brand like that dem you know practice kind of cast their vote with their wallet to support nhra top fuel drag racing nhra drag racing i hope that that can serve as a catalyst, you know, not to say that I want to see like all your competitors, all of Phillips is, I'm not looking for Samsung and LG to, to roll out top fuel programs next year, but you know what, if they did, it wouldn't be a bad thing, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, uh, you know, this movement is certainly healthy for the sport of NHRA drag racing. We know that. And just to kind of reiterate what Amber touched on, the great thing about working with Amber and Jim is their background in NHRA. They know, uh, you know, the great platform that NHRA and our team are able to offer. And that goes a long way. And obviously it starts with being able to, you know, have hospitality, right. And be able to bring clients out just like in a lot of other companies will have the ability to do as well when they get involved and, you know, bring their smart trailer technology out to the racetrack for, you know, for these individuals, for these companies to be able to see firsthand what they're able to do. And, um, you know, their, their products really speak for themselves. When you talk about smart trailer technology, you talk about, uh, you know, cameras in the back of trailers that look at the cargo inside. When you talk about GPS tracking, when you talk about uh, on-demand uh, pre-checks for different trailers, all this stuff that makes this company go, uh, you know, you know that it's the company that you want to get involved with. And, you know, I do think that other companies out there, other big companies can look at this Phillips Connect program and realize, you know what, we can roll out a very similar program and it can be successful. I believe it. I, and that's, that's my hope, you know, to be honest, is that I just, I love to see these new brands come into our sport and cast this vote of confidence in this particular type of entertainment or this particular type of uh, marketing program. Amber, um, you sent me a message in the, in the chat a second ago, talking about Jim Epler being the guy that basically in, brought trackside hospitality to drag racing. Can you talk a little bit more about just those opportunities that exist? And it's funny, you mentioned something that I think the entire drag racing world has always saw as a bit of a black eye or a, a hurdle to get over. And that is downtime, right? Mm -hmm. Time between runs or whatnot. But the way you phrased it seemed opportunistic. And I'd never really seen it phrased like that because it's like, you know what? That's actually a fairly interesting perspective because I don't know, like I think of major league baseball, the seventh inning stretch. I mean, that's like a thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to invest or put a little more time and energy into building some excitement and enthusiasm around that time between runs because it is truly unique to have that opportunity to engage a competitor, engage an athlete in the midst of their competition. Right. Our 
Phillips Connect isn't isn't about putting our name on the side of a car. It's the opportunity to bring the right customers to the track, show them the technology that's on Justin's trailer, show them the technology that's on Jim's custom tech trailer that we're building up. Um, Justin knows that any opportunity within NHRA, we want to support anybody who has a, a large trucking fleet or needs this technology. We even have talked about investing into the motorhome side and watching TPMS and knowing what their tires are doing, knowing what's going on, the cargo inside Justin's hauler. There's a lot of racers that would like to use this type of technology too. So whether we're working with Josh Hart with RNL or whether whatever opportunity Justin is just our flagship for now and not always for now, but we are building this program out with him and hopefully going into the future. But it's not about having Phillips Connect's name on the side of the car. It's about supporting our resellers. It's about supporting our customers and bringing the technology to them. I'm curious, could you guys, uh, the two of you, uh, could you run through some of the, I mean, a lot of the people that listen to this show are over the road truck drivers, right? Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of our podcast listeners, we hear all the time, like, Hey, I had an overnight drive and you saved my life. You kept me awake rambling mm -hmm. about drag racing. Um, I'm curious, could you, you know, run through some of the offerings and what that smart technology exists and what Phillips connects really represents and what you guys are offering, uh, the transportation industry right now? Sure. I think some of the biggest things we want to help a lot of the truck drivers are their CSA violations and safety. Um, brakes, lights, and tires are some of the biggest issues. And for now, well, in the past, it's been just a dumb box on wheels and you don't know what's going on. And especially with all these movements moving into autonomous and we're talking about all the future of electrical, we need to know what's going on behind that driver. If you don't know that your tires 250 degrees and you're about to have a wheel off and cause an accident or something like that, there's a lot of danger going into that. Um, and we could actually alert and give those warnings ahead of time. Um, the, the other part of it is, you know, you don't have downtime. We're getting those drivers home safely to their families and getting them back safe and getting them back sooner. Um, you don't have to be broken down on the side of the road or in a TA stop for two to three, two to three days and to get the right part in place. We, we're we're going to let you know that that trailer is safe before you even head out on the road. I think it's really interesting. I mean, I, Justin, like anybody who's done the drag racing dance uh, for any amount of time has likely had someone pull up alongside them on the highway and be like, hey, your trailer's on fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? And that's the only way you learn about it, you know, and until, you know, you pull over and it's in shambles. So it's a it's a fantastic thing or the uh, all always lovely showing up and your car has moved around and now needs repainted yeah. um, or, or two new doors and a wing and a parachute <laughs> or whatever else it tore up bouncing around in the trailer. But having an opportunity to sell something that really, what's the word, that really could make a difference in these people's lives and racers' lives. Justin, what's that mean to you? Because it's not like you're selling a, a pre-workout powder. It's not like you're selling, you know, some, you're selling something that pretty much everybody in the pits, especially your pro and high-level sportsman uh, competitors, they really can embrace and see a difference from. I mean, that's got to feel good. Oh, it does feel good. When you talk about these products, right, when you pull up to the racetrack, I mean, think about all the different rigs and the trucks and yeah. trailers that are there. It's like there's no other place that's going to have that many trucks and trailers in one spot, staying where they are right. for a few days at a time. And uh, it's great to be able to, you know, work with with Phillips Connect and offer their products that are going to help those individuals, help large fleets, help companies, because what they do essentially is they save time, they save money and they save lives. And at the end of the day, it's about ROI. Right. That's what want, that's what people want to see. So when you're able to show them, OK, you take some of these products, you put them on your trailer and then, you know, X amount of time down the road, you're actually going to be able to save money and make money by doing it. That's a good feeling knowing that you're able to help people. Absolutely, man. So curious, uh, just looking forward to 2022, uh, full slate of events. We're going to have, you know, we had a multitude of sellouts in the NHRA world last year, big crowds. Um, the two of you just looking at the well, the health and wellness of the sport of drag racing right now, we're, we're part, we're taking part drag illustrated, uh, is taking part in the SEMA motorsports parts manufacturers council, or excuse me, motorsports parts manufacturers, uh, conference. Yes, that was, it took me a second. Uh, that's going on this week right now. It's a virtual event in 2022. Historically, it's taken place in Southern California. But one of the things that I continue to hear, business is up, car culture's growing. We don't know what's going on, but there's, there's magic in the air. We're seeing growth like we haven't seen in a long, long time. 
considering that and that there does seem to be a, a new renewed energy and enthusiasm enthusiasm around the automobile and around racing. I mean, you got Netflix rolling out these Formula One documentaries. You cannot watch Discovery Channel without having drag racing shoved down your throat. Um, it's an interesting time. Is it what, what do you guys make of the landscape right now? Amber, I'll ask you first. I mean, from a corporate perspective and having an NHRA background, I mean, things look pretty good out here. Yeah, it's definitely uh, I took two years off from drag racing and they say it's in your blood and it's a hard time. I've got married and had a baby and I keep telling Justin, and Jim, I'm not going on the road again. <laughs> I love the sport. I love the people. And that's probably what I've missed the most. Um, but to see the growth of what the TV show has done, what Camping World has brought to the sport, some of these other B2B opportunities within the sport and all of how what I do now relates to what I did then. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of growth and a lot of exposure that brings as much as our company is a newer company within like the last five years, our parent company has been around forever and is on almost 100% of trucks and trailers nationwide. So to have that reputation that they have to bring to Phillips Connect and then to have NHRA as that platform to expose the world to this new company that uh, it, there's nothing but opportunities going into the future. 100%. Justin, what's your take on it? I mean, as someone who's been out here beating the brush, trying to sell sponsorships, trying to do this deal um, for a hot minute now, uh, is the, is the, the uh, what's the word? Is the climate kind of headed in the right direction? Do you feel like the, the, we're, it's resonating with people? Oh, definitely. I mean, for me, you know, all arrows are pointing up. When you look at the landscape of NHRA, uh, you know, there's so many things that you could focus on. But when you look at things like television, right, we have 22 races. Eight of the 22 races are on Fox Broadcast Network. Yeah. Those eight races are following NFL lead-ins, too, which is absolutely fantastic. And then something that I'm really looking forward to, to be honest with you, is the new NHRA video game that's going to be coming out. <laughs> Talk about getting those video games into the hands of kids. Xbox, PlayStation, whatever it might be, that's going to help our brand. It's going to help NHRA as a sport grow to where we need it to get to. So I think that getting NHRA professionals, getting the sport into the mainstream media is really important. And I think that they're doing a really good job of bringing us to that point. It, it, this video game, uh, I've been beating that drum for ab about a decade now. It's a difference maker. It's 100% a difference maker. The, the opportunity to get racing in front of young folks by way of a video game. I mean, there is no doubt in my mind that NBA 2K contributes to the success of the NBA and, and Madden football contributes to the success of NFL. That's how you create fans. It really is. And in, and in, in some instances, it's how you create participants, people that get introduced to it by way of a video game. The next thing you know, they're on a playing pickup basketball and, you know, then their kid goes on to play basketball. I mean, it's that is a very important thing. And I actually here on this show uh, a couple of months ago, Brian Loans, NHRA and Fox's own Brian Loans, showed us a couple. He probably got in trouble for it, but showed us a couple of uh, screen grabs, I guess, if you will, of the game. And it looks legitimately badass. Like I was gen I was concerned that it would be like haphazardly done. You know, like, oh, we got to get a video game. Click. Let's, let's find someone to do it so we can check that box and say that we have a video game. But I'm I'm really excited to see that the NHRA apparently took this matter very seriously partnered with a with a high-end game manufacturer and we're from what i understand we're about to have a really really badass video game in our hands so yeah it's i know behind the scenes mike rao has been talking about that for about five years and pushing that <laughs> forward so <laughs> no it's it's a good thing and it's it's fun because to be honest i think uh I was speaking candidly, everybody loves to bag on the NHRA, right? It's like every drag racer's favorite pastime is to like beat up the man, right? <laughs> However, there's a whole lot of stuff that they're doing really well. There's a whole lot of things that are headed in the right direction. And it's it's an exciting thing. And I, whenever the opportunity exists to give those guys in Glendora and in Indianapolis the credit that they deserve, man, 70 years is no accident, right? I point to that all the time. I mean, you think about something that has stood and been as significant as it is for 70 years, right? The fact that pretty much everybody in the drag racing business compares themselves to the NHRA, how the NHRA does it. Well, that's not how the NHRA does it. I want you to do it how the NHRA does it. That's 
it, that speaks to what they've accomplished. And it's just great to see. I mean, I actually wrote that down, Justin. All arrows are pointing up because I think that's just a great thing to hear from a top fuel racer, an active, competitive, race winning, championship contending top fuel competitor to hear you say like, hey, man, I think things are trending the right direction. It feels like a victory for our entire sport. It really does. I mean, look, nothing's ever going to be perfect, right? It's easy to sit here and bag on NHRA and say, oh, they could do this better. They could do that better. But I'll tell you one thing. I'd rather be in this position than be the person running NHRA right now. That much is for sure. Yes. So, I mean, they're doing a lot of really good things. You know, we have to think, you know, glass half full, not glass half empty. And I really like the trajectory and where the sport is going right now. And I think, you know, the most important thing is, and you see it right here with Amber and Jim, it's opening opportunities for major businesses to get involved, which is going to help take the sport to the next level. So I'm curious, um, have you, I mean, it, it would have been, uh, if we had Jim on here, I could have made it like, oh, I, I, but I'm going to use this anyways. I already had it written down. I'm like, I want to ask this. Was there, do you, did you have like a, a strong knowledge of Jim Epler and what he's done in our sport and who he was prior to this whole relationship, Justin? So I had a brief knowledge of who he yep. was. As you can imagine, I knew he was Mr. 300, right? That right. I knew. I said, okay, he's the first guy to go 300 miles per hour in a funny car, which I thought was a really cool deal, obviously. But the part about him that I didn't know was how involved he was on the business side when he was yeah. racing. So I had no idea that he was one of the first people, if not the first person to have a full hospitality program at the races. I didn't know that he was a team owner and he put most of, if not all his business deals together. So I think throughout this process, that's been the most exciting part to me because I really have a good appreciation for drivers who not only drive, which obviously takes a certain skill set, but are heavily involved in the business side of things too. And he was one of the first to incorporate the B2B programs and look how far it's come now. So I've learned a lot just over these last few months. In, uh, Super in far ahead of his time, I think. Oh, you yeah. know, I, I think that, uh, I mean, we've, we've talked about this before, but it's only relatively recently that John Force Racing started offering hospitality, right? I mean, they, that was something that they resisted essentially for a long time. And I mean, kudos to them. They didn't necessarily have to do that. But I mean, that B2B opportunity that exists in NHRA drag racing is rather significant. And there's another one. I remember Jim Epler rolling out a WWF funny car or like a WWE themed funny car. And I just seeing somebody think that far outside of the box, those are the type of people I like to be around. You know, those are the type of people you want to spend time with. So I was just curious because I do think the guy clearly has a, a track record of big ideas going way beyond the norm, getting away from traditional auto parts manufacturers or whatever and bringing outside companies. And I can't imagine that all that experience won't be extremely valuable as to you as a young team owner and young driver, Justin. It's very valuable, right? He's a guy that, uh, you know, another guy that can be a mentor to me, somebody that I can look up to because he's had success in the sport on the racetrack. He's had success in the sport off the racetrack. And just to be able to have a guy like that uh, in my corner is really great. And it's a privilege to be honest with you. He, Amber, Rob Phillips, the CEO of, of uh, you know, Phillips Connect, they're all going to be involved in actually implementing and running this program. And I think that's the great part about it. It's not like, you know, what Amber was saying, we're just going to stick Phillips Connect on the side of the race car and we'll figure it out as we go along. Right. That's not the way it's going to happen. It's okay. Phillips Connect is going to be on the side of the race car, but here's the business program that we're going to be able to implement around it. So it's successful for Phillips Connect. So it's successful for Justin National Racing and Davis Motorsports. So that's the great part. And Amber and Jim's background in NHRA is so critical in that. And it's just so exciting to work with people in a company like that, that have a plan and are really excited to implement it. Well, and I also want to add the opposite side. Jim took a lot of what he learned from the racing side and implemented it in the business. Wow. How he develops our products is based on, on quick installs and a team mentality. And he actually is one of the ones that engineers most of our products, um, our sensors, wow. everything that happens. He's the one that kind of takes takes these concepts and ideas and, and develops it into Phelps Connect products. Jim also, everything that we do, he calls it a pit stop. So we have a pit stop install. So instead of being up on a ladder or doing certain things, it's fast, it's easy, click here, plug it in. And it's based off of the Phillips harnessing and wiring, all based off of his knowledge of NHRA and how he puts a team together to make everything successful. That always makes me excited. And we we sometimes hear that from people 
uh, like at General Motors or Ford or Dodge about how valuable racing is as a test bed. And you do, you learn about efficiency, you learn about not allowing things to fail, you know, that you can't, you know, that, that reliability is as important a feature as anything else. I mean, you really can learn a lot from the racing life and it's cool to hear that other side of the coin. Amber, mm -hmm. I'm glad you shared that because it's, I don't know. I don't know that there's a lot of people that would believe that you can learn about your business or how to apply this, the situations that exist at the track to your daily life. It's kind of a cool notion. Um, speaking of daily lives, I thought it's been, you've done a fantastic job. We touched on this at PRI, Justin, just kind of opening up on social media. I think we've seen you really start to come out of your shell. You alongside your, your I mean, are calling Antron a teammate, kind of quasi teammate, a, a lion, yeah. a lion teammate. racer. Teammate. Okay, teammate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Antron it. Brown, both of you really putting yourselves out there, coming out of your shell. Um, how much has that been an enjoyable experience? I mean, what's that kind of developing a deeper connection with your fan base? Have you enjoyed that? I know it can be a challenge at times. Yeah, it can be a challenge, but it's fun, right? I think the most fun part about being involved in social media is not necessarily sharing what's going on but is the engagement that you get with the fans right because constantly you'll put up a post on facebook twitter instagram and the responses that you get you know where it's like hey you know i saw you in atlanta and you know you saw my kid there and you put him in the car you took a picture and he's still talking about it today that's the part of social media that i love is being able to realize you know what you know here i am i have you know the, the best job in the world i'm fortunate and lucky to be able to do it not everybody gets a chance to do it and the actual impact that we're able to have on people by just driving a race car right it's pretty amazing and to be able to engage with the fans and show them what's going on in my life is is really a privilege to be able to share that with them but their response is more so than anything else is what what keeps me going what keeps me motivated I think it, it's weird because that six degrees of separation, you kind of encounter that on Facebook. It's like you or on Twitter, Instagram or whatever. It's a it's a big world. Don't get me wrong, but it's it can be pretty small. You know, I mean, I, I'm always surprised whenever I bump into somebody at the races or whatever. And they're like, hey, you tagged me in a post or, you know, we talked on Facebook or you replied to my DM on Instagram. And it's like, man, you know what? For for there's no doubt that there's some bad that comes from all those things. But there is a whole lot of good and a whole lot of connection that has been created by that. And being able to connect with fans on that level from your phone, from the comfort of your own home while you're on the road or at an airport, it's pretty amazing. Amber, from the corporate perspective and your history with NHRA, I mean, I've seen you trying to get people to do interviews and push your drivers like, hey, you got to do this. We need you to do this. <laughs> um, two kind of two questions. First and foremost, how valuable is that content? I mean, we hear that word all the time. It's like the buzzword of 2021, 22 content, content, content for a company that's trying to fill all those buckets and, and be visible in a lot of places. How helpful is it when you have a partner, someone that you're, you're working with like Justin that's creating content? Mm -hmm. um, how, how helpful is that for you guys as a company? And then how glad are you to see NHRA stars kind of finally starting to to break through that wall, put themselves out there and, and be af celebrity athletes? You know, I've I've been on the opposite side with NHRA and working with Nikki on the social media, and I know the value of it. Um, about a year ago, I tested our social media with Jim's 300 mile an hour run and posted on the Phillips Connect page just to kind of give that look at what this exposure that NHRA and the social media following and how to grow our company. Um, and that was kind of my simple use case to get into NHRA. And now it's this three race uh, test with Justin. Um, we have to be very careful on what we're doing with our money within Phillips Connect and how we're using it, um, especially because we take pride in our employees and we do profit sharing and we take care of the team here and what we're going to do to you know, all the money that's coming from NHRA, there's a portion that's going back into Justin's race team and what we're going to develop and what we're going to do for other teams out there. Um, the presence that he has on social media and the team that he built with, with you know, um, Natalie Torrance and Elon Werner and the, the, the amazing um, PR opportunities that we have with his team is unmatched. So I'm really proud to be a part of Justin's team and also what NHRA is doing. Do you feel like, uh, are you seeing more people? I mean, I, I feel like I'm noticing that I, I'm Ron Caps all of a sudden is pretty damn active on social. Yeah. Antron Brown is all of a sudden pretty active on social media. Justin, and I mean, the, to name a few, 
there does seem to be a movement that direction. Are, are you glad to see racers embrace that? Because I do think that it's it's a necessary thing that hasn't been treated as a necessary thing until recently. Yeah, I mean, when I first started at NHRA, we had a lot of traditional marketing, um, and now so much has moved to the digital marketing. You actually see results. You see numbers behind what, what you're doing. Um, you're getting new followers. You're getting new new people to be able to expose a different way where you wouldn't before. So, you know, working with Phillips and this, this older company that was used to sending print mail and flyers and everything else and bringing up, up and saying, now look at this digital advertising and look at what these event marketing and bringing the, bringing the show to people versus expecting them to come to a trade show. There's a lot of changes that are happening over this COVID era. So. There's no doubt. And it's, I think it has, as much as it has been obviously very trying times for, for people around the world, there is no doubt. And I don't ever mean to make light of it. I do think that we have learned a lot. I know like as a business owner, as a human being, as a father, a husband, a multitude, a friend, I mean, you learn a lot through this, the, this environment we've been in the last couple of years, ways to be more efficient, ways to pri you know, prioritizing things. It's been as tough as it has been, I definitely think there has been some some bright spots. And hearing companies, big, big companies, recognize that they can't just do things the way they've always done them. I mean, I think those are some of the most dangerous words in the Eng English language because yeah. that's how we've always done it. That's a, that's a scary mindset, you know, but it has existed for a long time. And I think COVID kind of forced everybody to to adjust course. So it's been as bad as it has been and uh, tragic as it has been, there's definitely been some silver linings to these clouds. Guys, um, let's talk real quick, just 2022, the first race uh, of this relationship, obviously the, the Phoenix test session, but the winter nationals, it's only a few weeks away, which is, I mean, it's kind of stunning that it's it's upon us already. How excited are you to get the the season started and how important is, you, is it for you, Justin, to start Start fast, right? I mean, I, with the countdown and the way the NHRA schedule works, um, th there seems to be kind of like a focus on just being ready for the countdown. But how important is it for you, especially with these partners, to go out and get started on the right foot, be successful early? Oh, it's critical. I mean, when you look at the top fuel field this year and what it's going to entail, and I know that there's still a few announcements to come out and even more cars are going to come out and race. It's going to be a fight. Every single race there's going to be a tremendous amount of cars that are going to be able to go there and win races. And, you know, we look at the countdown and 10 people make the countdown. I'm telling you right now, there's going to be way more than 10 cars that are going to be countdown capable. So we have to starting in Pomona, begin to stack points right away, immediately and be able to get some momentum going forward, uh, you know, to establish throughout the year. So, I mean, it's really important. It's going to be the first race. We're going to roll out our new hospitality program with Phillips connect and, and all of our great marketing partners. So, we have a lot going on and uh, you know, the guys at the shop, man, they've been, they've been working so hard throughout the off season. Like we said earlier, it's such a tight time frame. You know, they've been in, they've been in there day in and day out. Uh, Mike Green, Tommy DeLago, Dustin Davis and the guys. So they're getting the car ready to go. We're getting the marketing ready to go. And, and now's the time to really see it come all to fruition. And, you know, we got to, we got to start fast and finish strong. And that's our goal this year. Um, Amber, before we let you go, uh, and I appreciate your time. I know you're kind of filling in for us here today and please send our best, uh, to Jim. And I would love to arrange for him to come join us at some point in the future. And we can, we can bench race for a little while, but how excited yeah. are you for this first one? Uh, I'm assuming you will go. I will be there. I'll be okay. there the first three races. Um, okay. so I, I've agreed to get this test program up <laughs> and running and make sure that it's, uh, it's, it's the, the right way we want to do it. Um, I'm excited to get it started. Um, I've given I've given Jim more of a passion to get back into it again. It's giving him more of a passion to get out there and sail. Um, you know, we've always had a really long uh, sales cycle. It takes a year to get. I mean, we have five uh, five of the biggest uh, transportation companies in the world on our on our under our belt right now, wow. and to take those and shorten the sales cycle by bringing it to NHRA. That's, that's our goal. And Jim just has this renewed passion for the sport and for the company. And I think it's only going to be good, um, coming out of it and, you know, kicking off Pomona in our backyard where Phillips, Phillips industries, our parent company is in, uh, Santa Fe Springs. So that's only, you know, a half hour from the track. 
our corporate offices here in Irvine, California. Um, so, you know, Pomona's our home track. Yeah, so hometown, home, hometown to crowd. Get out there and show it off to our staff and show it off to our partners and customers and just it's, it's going to be a good event. I tell you what, and I've, I've said this to people many, many times, like the, the drag strip is a great selling environment. I mean, it may not be fantastic like if you just have everybody packed in the staging lanes or whatever and it's 600 degrees, but you start talking about being at, you know, the, the Fairplex, being at a, a cool historic event like that and the, 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 the vibe that exists at the races, especially early on with all that optimism and excitement. Nothing's gone wrong yet. First mm-hmm. race of the year. Everybody's excited. Um, I hope it's a, a big business weekend for you guys, Amber. And thank you for your time. Seriously, very much. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks to Phillips Connect for supporting the sport of drag racing. It's not lost on us, and we'll do our part to support you guys. Justin, can I get you to stay for five more minutes? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Amber. We'll talk soon, thanks okay? Bye. Take care. I'm going to move her. I'm clicking. I'm running the ones and twos over here. Wicka, wicka, right. JT. Um, well, last question for you, Justin, and I just wanted to uh, – talk a little bit of racing, yeah. how much, how just specifically about something that I think we've seen the last couple of years. First, it was moving to a thousand feet. It made the starting line much more significant. Uh, all of a sudden you saw more and more and more pressure being put on drivers to cut a light last year. It, I don't know if everybody was just unconscious, if everybody was just eating <laughs> their Wheaties. Uh, I'm not sure. I do think you're, I think you personally had something to do with it. Um, the expectation of drivers in fuel racing has changed. It really has. I bet your dad could speak on this without question that it wasn't that long ago that, Hey man, if you go out there and go like 60, 70, you're winning. If your shit's fast, you're going to win. You know what I mean? Whereas, I mean, I think guys like Tony Schumacher, 45 to 70, and he's a nine time champion or whatever. Right. And now granted he got a hot rod, you know, significantly fast race car, um, with a competitive advantage over the field with Alan Johnson behind, a standing behind him. But I'm just curious how, A, I mean, what's that like at this point? I mean, did you notice, I mean, didn't you feel things ratchet up a level last year? There's a huge difference. Right? 100% I noticed that there's a huge difference. So when you go back and you think back to 10, 20 years ago, right, it was all these cars going out and there was such a difference in the elapsed time and the speed that they were running. So the difference on the starting line was not as significant. As long as you were in a certain window, chances are you were going to be okay. But now, especially last year, you've seen guys step up and they are just unconscious on the starting line. And every little bit that you can get on the starting line now makes a difference. And with the kind of competitors that we have, there is no room to let up. Whether it's the first round, second round, semifinals or finals, you always have to be on your A game. And right now we're in a position where everybody's bunched so close together that it really makes that big of a difference. And as a driver, you feel that pressure. And you understand that you need to be prepared every time you go up there. And I think most of us love it. We enjoy it because that's why we want to do it. We want to help our team. We want to be successful. It's, I have two thoughts on it that I find that I think are, I'd like to share, I guess. Um, first and foremost, I do think that there was that youth movement. You start getting guys, and not like super young, but you get these guys that have bracket racing backgrounds, sportsman racing backgrounds. I'm talking specifically right now about guys like Sean Langdon, who develop a reputation for being a good lever. Then you just get some young blood in the sport, guys such as yourself that are just athletic, able-bodied people. Uh, and, and you see things start to intensify, but something something happened last year where the the pressure got. I mean, I think about guys like Mike Salinas, and I've often wondered if it's good or bad because we talk about this in pro mod racing, which is something I I hope is near and dear your heart with your dad's mm-hmm. history of door slammer drag racing. But you know, whenever they allowed, well, they were talking this last year, and they did initially switch from automatic shifters to manually shifting. Right. And the thing that I was hearing from throughout the industry is this shit's hard that not all the rich guys that can afford to go pro mod racing can do this, right? I mean, it's hard to do. We've got to put automatic shifters back in them because we're going to lose cars because people can't do it. And then I look at top fuel and it's kind of similar because, you know, a a, a relatively healthy middle-aged guy that's got some money or got some corporate ties and can, can get some budget wrestled away to go fuel racing. He's screwed. You know what I mean? Like those yeah. kind of, I, and I don't say this in like a negative connotation, but the hobby racer type, you, you're, you're done. There's no chance that you're going to, you know, get lucky because there's just too many killers out here at this point. No, you're right. I mean, look, if you want to be a hobby racer and you have the money to do it, there's no doubt about it, right? You can come out 
and compete. But at this level, with the stage we're in right now with Top Fuel, with Funny Car, it's extraordinarily difficult to be successful. There is a lot of talent and skill that goes into it at this point. Obviously, a lot of it's on the starting line, and a lot of it's just in your ability to drive, right? There are so many things that happen in that 3.7 seconds that you have to be prepared for and you have to be ready for. So sure, as a hobby racer, you can come out there and race and, and do it's it. Great. It's great, right? We want more sports for the sport. 100%. But to be successful, it takes a whole nother element, right? It obviously starts and ends with the people that you have and the team that you have. But as a driver, man, it is just getting tougher and tougher out there to be able to go out there and compete and win rounds. I mean, you see the people that are like these, some of these whole shot losses from last season, I'm going and the heartbreak on the faces of some of these people and it's, and it becoming more of a storyline I found interesting, like late in the season, you know, Brittany force, it was like a established thing. She was struggling, right? People were talking about it. It was existing in the news. And I found myself going, man, I don't know that drag racers of yesteryear really had to deal with that kind of pressure because whole shot. I mean, it was kind of hit and miss, you know what I mean? Like those moments where it would just didn't happen as frequently and it wasn't as much a part of the conversation over the course of time. Whereas now, I mean, holy crap. I mean, there's a whole shot win after whole shot win after whole shot win. Uh, every time you pull up drag race central to check the results, I mean, you've got to be unconscious. I hate to keep using that word, but these people, you don't see, Oh, 10 lights in fuel racing. That's never been the case, but now it's quickly becoming the case. Where do you look for, Action time at this point in time, Justin, are you working on yourself? Or are you working on the car? Yeah, uh, I think you can work, you know, you can find it in different places. I think it starts and ends with the driver, right? Cars react differently. So some stuff that you might see from some drivers might not necessarily be them if they're slow, just like it might not necessarily be all them if they're fast. It's a combination of driver and car. You know, for me, I'll always take the responsibility of myself. And Mike Green gives me a fast reacting race car and he gives me a fast and quick race car to go down the racetrack. But I have to do my job to put ourselves in a position to win. And, you know, you talk about how close these races are. And, you know, last year in Bristol, I cut a 074 and I won on a whole shot. I went to Pomona, I cut a 055 and I lost on a whole shot. So it's like, you just, you just don't know. That's why you always have to be on your A game. And it's a combination of things. It's a combination of driver. It's a combination of team and car and crew chief. But from a driver's perspective, the best guys are the ones who are the most consistent. The guys who stay within a small window so you know what you're going to get every time. Do you think that there's a chance that it could actually, I mean, we've talked about this a lot over the years just here on this show and on the pages of Drag Illustrated Magazine and on dragillustrated.com that we've worried at different times that, you know, the, the hired gun driver was kind of going away. Most of the people that were out competing at the highest levels of drag racing were guys that were independently wealthy or like we talked a moment ago, you know, have corporate ties or have a business that would support their racing endeavors. And it was, it's funny because I, I just wonder if the door is being opened, like this level of the level of competition that exists in top fuel and funny car and what is required of drivers today. I don't know that you can be like on a conference call with China running your company and then go beat Justin Ashley in the final. I don't think you can do that. I, and so I wonder if that opens the door for more hired gun drivers or if we'll see some of the people, um, you know, maybe there's some opportunities that will be created because it isn't something that you can just spend a bunch of money and buy good equipment and be out there being the thick of things. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does. I think you might see that movement, especially because it's getting more competitive. There might be teams out there that have the well-established funds. funding behind yeah. them, right? And they figure, okay, let's just bring in a hired gun and he'll be able to go out and not have to worry about anything else and be able to drive, which is great if you have the ability to do that. Me personally, I happen to enjoy the business side of things, right? right? I have a real estate business in New York. I really enjoy the business side of racing and working with our partners and working with our sponsors too. So that's always going to be involved in it as well. And I think it's it's healthy to be that way. But you'll see guys that'll come out there and and like you said, um, you know, be hired guns and come out there and you know have nothing else to worry about and absolutely just race like there's nothing to lose and let it rip. Which yeah, I mean, that's one of the things we, yeah, I mean, and that's what we, I honestly think that's what we need, right? Because there are tons of, I mean, I think about guys that are running these million dollar bracket races and these big payout bracket racers. There's some incredible talent that exists in our sport. I mean, tons of it, super talented drivers, but that, you know, the dream of going fuel racing or going to the big show was kind of the barrier to entry was so high because it wasn't really about your ability. It was about your budget, 
Right. You know what I mean? And it does seem that headed into 2022, there's a newfound onus on your ability. Like, because you can't, you can't outspend an 010 or a guy that goes 035 all the time. You know what I mean? Like there's no, nothing you can do to contend with that. So hopefully this is an, a situation that benefits the sport of drag racing uh, in the future. I, last question. And we had this Corey Mahalik, longtime viewer of the show, great young man that's uh, doing awesome things in top alcohol dragster. He asked, what do you think, you know, your ascension to fuel racing? Um, how did the top alcohol dragster uh, experience kind of set you up for this. Uh, did you, do you look at anything back there that, uh, any experiences that have benefited you today, or do you feel like you were kind of getting set up for that? Yeah, absolutely. Everything. First of all, I love Corey. He is the best, great representative and yes. a great person to have in drag racing and a great driver, but it's actually a great question. I think that maybe there's nothing that can really set you up the right way for top fuel other than making laps. But if there's anything that's going to put you in a position to do that, it's racing top alcohol dragster. Obviously, there's little intricacies uh, inside the car that are going to be different. For, but for the most part, everything's really the same in terms of procedures that you do in the race car. So it just happens maybe, you know, the margin for error is a little bit wider in a top alcohol dragster or things happen a little bit slower relative to a top fuel car. So it's excellent preparation for racing in top fuel and just the more laps, that's what I would recommend for anybody. The more laps you can make in a top alcohol dragster, the more you can experience different things and feel different things and apply it to top fuel. And I know that it really was a big stepping stone and a big help for me. It's awesome, man. Well, hey, Justin, I truly appreciate the time. Thank you so much. We're excited for you. We're happy for you. And we can't wait to see what happens next. And I suppose we'll see you in a couple of weeks, which is weird to say out loud. It is, right? But we'll see you in Pomona. Thanks for everything, Wes. Hey, no you problem, man. Thank you. Stay out of trouble, all right? Yeah.